Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Vicki Eguskiza, class of 1987, and the co-president of the Medical Parents Association. I am truly delighted to welcome the class of 2024, and all of you, family members and friends, as the newest members of the Miller School family. As an alumni, I can tell you that the Miller School of Medicine is a phenomenal institution. As a parent of an MDMPH student and 2013 and 2016 Miller School graduates, I share your excitement and sense of pride. I can also appreciate your concerns about safety. Tonight, we will learn more about the student experience and the standards we have in place to keep them safe. Our organization helps family members further the goals of their medical students by being involved. One of our roles is to serve as volunteers for the Mitchell Wolfson Senior Foundation Department of Community Service, better known as Wolfson Docs. Wolfson Docs is a student-run organization that brings health screenings and education to the underserved residents of our community. It is an important part of the Miller School experience and MPA members proudly volunteer their time at the health fairs or donate necessary items. Of course, COVID-19 has changed everything this year. We will be assessing our programs for the coming year, but rest assured, there will be opportunities to get involved. We hope you will join the MPA during the students' time here and we'll have more information on how you can do that at the end of the program. We have an informative program lined up for you. To take us forward is my co-president, Dr. Lourdes Sangenis. Good evening, everyone. I am excited to welcome you to the Miller School of Medicine family. As the proud parents of a 2017 Miller School graduate, I can tell you that your student is going to have an outstanding learning experience. And having completed my residency at UM Jackson, I know students have phenomenal practical opportunities to apply what they learn. Our medical education leadership will share what the next four years will have in store for them. But first, it is my privilege to welcome Dr. Andrew Ford, Dean and Chief Academic Officer of the Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Ford is a world-renowned pediatric surgeon who continues to advance excellence at the Miller School of Medicine. He has made such differences in the world. Before joining us, Dr. Ford served as a senior vice president and chief of surgery at the Children's Hospital Los Angeles. He also serves as the vice dean of medical education, professor and vice chair for clinical affairs in the Department of Surgery at the Keck School of Medicine at, off the University of Southern California. Prior to that, he was the chief of the Division of Pediatric Surgery and Surgeon in Chief at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Dr. Ford received his bachelor's degree from Princeton University and his MD from Harvard Medical School. He also received his Master of Health Administration from the University of Southern California, Sol Price School of Public Policy. He is a pro preeminent researcher, physician, and mentor, and in his time here has already laid the groundwork for transformative student experiences. We are incredibly lucky to have him here with us at the U. Join me in welcoming Dr. Ford. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sengenis, for this very warm introduction. And good evening to everyone. Let me extend a heartfelt welcome to the Middle School of Medicine, to all the parents on the call tonight, and especially to the parents of the members of the great class of 2024. I'm particularly thrilled to welcome you and your children to the Middle School family. As a point of departure, I want to thank you, the parents, for trusting us to educate and prepare your children to become physician leaders who will be empowered to transform lives and inspired to serve our global community. These students are embarking on an, on an incredible journey to achieve their dream 
fulfill their potential in their raison d'être as future physicians. These students represent the very best that our universities have to offer. They are truly the creme de la creme. I want to reassure all of you parents that the health and safety of our students is our top priority as we train them to become outstanding physicians. You'll learn more about our safety measures later on tonight. Our mission at the middle school is to equip our students to become transformational leaders who will shape the future of medicine, lead health systems to deliver value-based healthcare, and champion discovery and its translation into clinical interventions to improve the health of humanity. Parents, your students are joining a premier academic medical center that is at the forefront of advances in clinical medicine and leading breakthroughs in biomedical research. Just last month, the middle school launched the first phase three clinical trial of a COVID-19 vaccine to help stop this global pandemic. Our scientists are hard at work developing rapid testing and effective novel treatment strategies to combat this vaccine pandemic. The same outstanding, brilliant scientists and clinicians on the middle school faculty are totally dedicated to the success of our students. For what could be more important to the mission of the Middle School of Medicine than the education of its medical students. We are confident that your students, our students, are fully prepared for the exciting challenges ahead and that they will not only excel in their studies, but also emulate the outstanding teachers that they will come to know at the Middle School by becoming great physicians, superb clinician scientists, and outstanding leaders in academic medicine. They will gain immeasurable experience from our dedication to addressing health disparities and improving healthcare for underserved, disenfranchised communities throughout South Florida. In fact, our rapid, in fact, our response to COVID-19 has emphasized student engagement and ingenuity from coordinating personal protective equipment donations to staffing the COVID-19 hotlines. Meaningful service and a rigorous academic curriculum will prepare our students for medical leadership and exemplary clinical care. The class of 2024 will be the first entering class to experience NextGen MD a highly innovative curriculum that will allow our students to succeed in the rapidly changing technology-driven landscape of today's healthcare ecosystem. And it will prepare them to become transformational leaders. To that end, I'm thrilled to share an important milestone in our progress. I'm honored to introduce the new Executive Dean of the University of Miami Middle School of Medicine and the founding chair of the Department of Medical Education, Dr. Latha Chen Tran. She's an extraordinary pediatrician, educator, and academic leader. Prior to joining us, Dr. Chen Tran was the Vice Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs at the, and the Donahoe Distinguished teaching professor at Stony Brook University. Dr. Chandran received her medical degree from Kerala University in India and completed her residency in pediatrics at Stony Brook. She obtained a master's degree in public health from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. She is truly one of the outstanding leaders in medical education. We are thrilled to have her as our executive dean and founding chair of the Department of Medical Education at this exciting time in the history of the middle school. It is now my distinct honor to welcome Dr. Chen Tran. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dean Ford. Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome each of you to our annual 
Medical Parents Association meeting this year virtually. Let me first offer congratulations to each of you here today. I know every one of you has made tremendous commitments and sacrifices for your child to be here today. Yes, it is a very proud moment for each of you and for those 200 students we have admitted to our school this year. Let me start by saying a little bit about myself. I have been just here for over a month, but I have learned a lot about this place and the people here. I'm a pediatrician who did my training and work at Stony Brook University in New York the past 30 years. I won many teaching awards, including the highest teaching award in the State University of New York system. I was fortunate enough to have mentors to guide me through my early faculty years so that I was able to become an endowed distinguished teaching professor there. I was the only educator endowed in that institution. I have worked in the office of the Dean in various capacities for 17 years before coming here. Uh, there, I led our educational team to change the curriculum completely in 2014 and was able to raise our school's profile nationally. And I had to deal with the COVID crisis earlier this year in New York. So I come with some experience. So when Dean Ford recruited me here, he wanted us to move Miller School of Medicine into national prominence. That is not a small task, but it's a task that is interesting, challenging, and doable. Yes, I feel confident we can do this because of the people I am meeting here. I am impressed, first and foremost, with the quality and caliber of our medical students. They are just wonderful. Although I haven't met any of your children yet, since they have gone through our rigorous admissions process and are here now, I know they are of high quality. I am also very encouraged by the quality of the faculty who I have met. Diverse expertise, passions, and talents align with a strong sense of commitment to the U. That bodes well. Additionally, Dean Ford has made a commitment for change, a commitment to move us to a high-functioning learning organization, and his vision has truly energized the faculty here. As he said, we are starting a state-of-the-art ambitious new curriculum called NextGen MD, the goal of which is to produce self-directed, transformative leaders in healthcare. That is why I said taking Miller School of Medicine into national prominence is something that's doable. All the ingredients are here. We just have to mix them together in the right amounts at the right times with the right temperature. Well, COVID-19 has thrown a monkey wrench into our plans. Yes, I know that many of you are anxious, rightfully so, about the safety of your sons and daughters, and we will definitely address that. The president of our university happens to be a physician and a public health expert known nationally. We are thoughtfully planning a scientifically sound approach to opening our school and to education in general. Yes, I get to deal with COVID a second time. How many people can claim that? But challenging times are exceptional learning opportunities as well. We as an institution are learning more about COVID, piloting phase three vaccine trials, conducting research into various aspects of COVID, and figuring out creative ways to train doctors safely using hybrid models of education. We have been training our faculty to teach in virtual and hybrid platforms, and you will hear more about this soon. The engagement of the faculty and the students in our community programs, the Wolves and Dogs program, for example, has been really impressive. They make a real difference in our communities. There is significant emphasis also in health science system sciences in our curriculum. That's because we anticipate that our students will become leaders in health systems in the future. We need such leaders to be ready to deal with the next unexpected health crisis that will inevitably happen during their careers. We also place strong emphasis on professionalism in our ideals. We provide them longitudinal, safe learning communities where we allow them, each of them, to grow individually along this professional journey. Our next-gen MD curriculum provides exceptional opportunities for dual degrees in four years, as well as scholarship of various kinds. Our goal? 
is to transform our students into future thinkers and leaders in medicine, self-directed, confident, mature, and thoughtful physicians who can make a real impact on society and healthcare. So congratulations to each of you. Thank you for sharing your talented children with us. Thank you for being part of this journey with us as we mold them into outstanding caring physicians for the future. Um, if you have any questions that come up during this talk, please feel free to use the Q&A feature of Zoom and we'll try to answer them. Thank you. Now, I would like to introduce my team at our Miller School of Medicine. We have an amazing team of deans and you will meet a few of them tonight, not all. So the first person you're going to meet is Dr. Gauri Agarwal, who graduated from the Miller School of Medicine in 2000. She is the Associate Dean for Clinical Curriculum, and we wanted to make sure we address the safety concerns first. So Dr. Agarwal. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Chandran. First of all, congratulations on raising children who decided to pursue a career path in the service of humanity at one of the most challenging times in the history of our profession. I'm a mother myself. Um, I understand how important their safety is to all of you. So my principal job tonight will be to review the safety protocols and then we'll get to the excitement of our brand new curriculum. So we'll go to the next slide and I can go over the protocols. So every single one of our students will be undergoing a screening before they even enter campus. So all of our entering first year medical students received the survey last week, which they're completing this week. This is regarding any symptoms that they've had or any exposures that they may have had. If they have any symptoms or exposures, they'll be routed to our employee health and our student services team who'll make sure that they are taken care of. Any time that a student will be on campus, they're going to be doing the same thing. They'll be filling out a symptom survey so that will be alerted if any student is having any concerning symptoms and again be routed to our student services team. We've had a lot of experience with this because our third and fourth year medical students started in June and over months we've been developing and refining our protocol and it's going very well. Very importantly, we've told the students that all of the protocols that we've developed for on campus need to be continued anytime they're off campus in the community. So this means that they need to follow our protocols as well as the CDC guidelines. Things like not attending large gatherings or parties, that they use their mask anytime they're in the public setting like the grocery store or gas station, and that they're trying to follow physical distancing protocols even when they're off campus. So in that vein, we pro provided them all with a welcome kit this week that they'll receive, and that includes a monthly supply of surgical masks so that they have plenty of masks anytime that they're on campus or in the community. They're going to be receiving goggles as well as a reusable face shield, which they can clean as needed. We've seen over the past few months that the use of masks has been extraordinarily effective of protecting everyone in the health system in order to mitigate any type of spread within our health system. And importantly, if a student does test positive and needs to quarantine at home, we will have a way for them to continue their curriculum virtually so that they don't lose a lot of time and have to make up a lot of material when they return. So on the next slide, I'll show you a few photos of some of the changes we've made to our physical facility. You'll see some changes to our auditorium space in order to accommodate these physical distancing protocols. You'll see some signs outside of doorways that indicate the maximum capacity of the room. There's signage almost everywhere that indicates uh, some reminders about hand washing, about physical distancing and mask use. And in the center of this slide, you'll see our students on their emergency medicine clerkship who are learning how to suture. And our facilities team developed this plastic um, barricades between the students facing and on the sides so that they can suture appropriately. And they're wearing their mask and their face shield at all times. Go to the next slide. So, Dr. Deshpande, who I'll introduce in a bit, will tell you details about our medical curriculum. Very broadly, they're going to be experiencing a hybrid protected curriculum. Hybrid meaning some of their experiences will be on campus live, and some will be remote via several of our virtual platforms. Protected meaning that they're going to be following these safety protocols at all times, as I've said, on campus and in the community. Anytime they need to be in a very large group setting, those will be done virtually via Zoom. 
We do want them on campus though for small group sessions and for their very important clinical skills training. We think this is really important for students to work with their peers and their faculty to develop those mentoring relationships and to learn how to work as teams. They'll also have the opportunity to be on campus for in-person anatomy lab sessions for ultrasound training. And as Dean Ford referenced, we're really trying to create transformational leaders. That means that they need to take part in all of the amazing research opportunities, service opportunities, and, re and leadership opportunities we have on our campus. On the next slide. What can all of you do as parents? I want to remind you that there is a message from President Julio Frank that Dr. Chandran mentioned is a physician and a public health leader, global public health leader, and this is from one of his messages to the parents for all of the undergraduate students. He wanted to remind all of the parents that you can be an important ally in reminding your children that they have to protect themselves at all times in the community in order to protect everybody within the health system. Next slide. So I'm gonna transition here from our safety protocols to some more exciting things, which are our outcomes from our outstanding students. There are three important exams that they take that are national exams where we get to see how our students do compared to national standards. So step one is typically taken between their third and between their second and third year of medical school. And the step two exam is taken in their fourth year of medical school. There's a clinical knowledge exam and a clinical skills exam. So in the numbers that you see here, you'll see that in the step one exam, their national average is around 230 or so every year, and our students have routinely done over the national mean. The same thing for the clinical knowledge exam, which is the step clinical knowledge mean score, it typically hovers around the 240 range, and our students have done over the national mean. And the clinical skills exam, which is a pass-fail exam, we have had a high Rate, with very few failures across the board. And the next slide. And this is the ultimate outcome, is the match percentage. So match day is that very exciting day when every medical student finds out where they'll be continuing their training. And you can see that the percentage of our students who match into residency training is quite high. There's always a few students who choose to do non-clinical careers after um, medical school, but our vast majority of our students go on to residency training, as you see, and this is a really a joyous day. I know all of our first year students are just beginning, but it'll seem just like a blink of an eye before that really joyous day for you and all of your family. So now it's my pleasure in the next slide to introduce a very close colleague of mine, Dr. Amar Deshpande, who's a professor of medicine and gastroenterologist and the assistant dean for medical education. He's really spearheaded our efforts in developing the next gen MD curriculum and he'll be speaking to you a little bit more about that now. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to also welcome all of the parents uh, and we're looking forward to working with your children over the next few years here at the Miller School. So my role in the next uh, five minutes or so is just to give you a, a brief overview of the work we've done in the curriculum. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the first things uh, when Dean Ford got here, we were already about half a year or so into our uh, formation of this Next Gen MD curriculum. And one of the first things he asked us was what our why statement was. And so we took a step back, and for those of you that have heard about uh, starting with why, <clears throat> trying to understand why are we really here? Fundamentally, in one short phrase, why are we here? And so a lot of us put our heads together and came up with, uh, came up with what you're going to see, which is empower to transform lives and inspired to serve our global community. And you've heard uh, Dean Ford say that earlier today, and we really take that to heart. And so our goal in everything that we do is to very intentionally ensure that what we're doing is creating a curriculum that empowers our learners and our patients uh, to, to transform lives and inspire them to serve not only our local, but our global community through all the efforts that they do. And what, what does that actually turn into? We really wanna create uh, transformational leaders who will shape the future of medicine, direct health systems, champion discovery, and its translation to clinical intervention. And you already heard an example of what's going on with the coronavirus vaccine here at the Miller School. So as we, uh, as we, took, that, uh, as we took that phrase and tried to understand how we could best apply it to the new curriculum, we approached it much like we do many clinical problems, which is really trying to understand what base of evidence currently exists uh, that best informs our curriculum. So we looked at a lot of the evidence and how young adults learn 
we spoke to over 40 schools across the country and the world on how their uh, innovative curriculums worked and what worked for them. And importantly, we looked at what is really unique about us here at the University of Miami. Next slide, please. And so as we were creating our curriculum, we looked at what were our institutional objectives. And you don't need to read any of these specific terms, but one of the important things to keep in mind about modern medicine is none of us uh, on this call are smarter in terms of knowledge and the phones that are in our hand. Being a good physician these days is not about memorizing a bunch of minutia, it's about applying that medical knowledge to be able to inform patient care and become a successful researcher, uh, clinician, and educator. And so these four big green boxes on top, you notice that only one of them actually refers to biomedical knowledge and clinical care, certainly a critical aspect of what we do. But equally important are the other buckets. So practice-based learning, how do we understand the evidence and apply it? If you asked any of us six months ago what we knew about coronavirus, we knew as much as anybody else did, which was, a, um, which was it was a common respiratory virus, and probably not much more beyond that unless you're an infectious disease physician. If you asked us six months ago how to work Zoom, we would have some idea, but be mostly uh, guessing. But what we hope to create are self-directed learners. So I think that all of us now are far more knowledgeable about Zoom, far more knowledgeable about the coronavirus, because not because we learned it in med school, but we learned how to learn in medical school. So really understanding the practice of practice-based learning. Uh, also important is the bucket that you see second from the left about health system science. You've historically heard curricula talk about the basic science years where you talk about foundational sciences and the clinical science years where you go see patients. But equally important is that third part of health system science, not only how patients on an individual basis work, but how does population health work and how do the systems in place either advantage or disadvantage different groups of people from accessing adequate care. And then finally, the, the aspect of professionalism and interpersonal skills. If you wanna be a successful physician, you need to not only be good at the three boxes you see on the right, but also how to interact well with others, both patients and uh, colleagues, and of course, how to be professional across the various definitions of professionalism. Uh, next slide, please. So in a very uh, broad strokes, here's what our four years looks like. You see that there is broken into three phases. The, the first phase is 14 months, called the pre-clerkship phase. That is most classically similar to the first two years of med school. Uh, you, uh, in, the, in the old curriculum. So you might say, well, that's a lot less basic science that you're teaching. But in point of fact, what we're doing is taking a lot of the basic science that used to just be memorized at the beginning and never really adequately applied later and turning that into 14 months of a pre-clerkship phase that has a clinical tilt to it. Then an integrated clerkship phase, I'll show you in the next slide. Then dedicated time to study for both step one and step two after the clerkships, another paradigm shift for our school. And then finally, 17 months to really create a unique curriculum. And the way to think of the bottom part of the advanced phase is this is really 200 unique curricula. Each student has their own set of ideas of what they want to accomplish based on their residency path and their scholarly pursuit. Next slide. <clears throat> so I'll close with just a, a little overview of what this really means across the three phases. So the first phase, we teach for about 12 weeks some foundational uh, basic sciences and then 30 weeks of explaining basic sciences in the context of symptoms. Patients don't come to us saying that they're on the cardiovascular module or the GI module. They come to us with chest pain or leg pain or a headache. So really approaching it from the perspective of symptoms, not just a particular organ, and doing that for 14 months, then spending a year on the integrated clerkships, integrated not only across basic science and clinical science, but also across different specialties. So uh, combining the, 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 the perspectives of an emergency medicine physician and an anesthesiologist and a surgeon in one integrated clerkship to see how a surgical patient is addressed. And then a phase three, which is 17 months in, in length, really focusing on unique integrated experiences of both basic and clinical sciences, really targeted to the student's very specific interest in residency and a very robust scholarly is concentration in dual degrees uh, we are basically one of the biggest schools in the country in terms of the numbers of dual and joint degrees we offer, and we plan to expand that even further over the next few years, including the class of your students. And for a very select group of students, at least up front, the potential to early transition to residency within three years. Next, uh, next slide. And then uh, what you see here, one more, um, is across all of this is the really fundamental theme of not just memorizing information and taking care of patients, but understanding medicine as a profession, the essentials 
of medical practice, things like clinical skills and professionalism, how to communicate, how to understand how, how populations um, are cared for, and of course, nutrition, wellness, and personal development, both of our learners as well as of our patients. So this kind of gives you a broad overview of what we hope to accomplish or what we will accomplish in the next four years with your students in our innovative Next Gen, M uh, Next Gen MD curriculum. And we're really excited to work with them um, in this exciting endeavor. So with that, I will um, hand it off to Roderick King, who is our Senior Associate Dean for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. Great. Thank you, Dr. Deshpande, and uh, thank you all of you for being here this evening. Um, truly is a pleasure to have an opportunity to share a little with you about the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement, or as we affectionately like to call it, ODICE. Um, tonight, I'll give you a very brief, high-level overview of our office and share with you just some of the great opportunities that students will have to get involved with the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement. Next slide. So the office is composed of a number of core staff and faculty. Uh, just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of who they were. Uh, we have Dr. Dr. Marie Denise Gervais, who is the Assistant Dean of Admissions and Diversity. Uh, Dr. Symes, who's heavily involved with a, a lot of mentoring and our, our pipeline programs in our office. But in particular, I wanted to introduce Dr. Vega, uh, who is our Executive Director um, as well as Janet Ringas Sanchez and Jalisa Cook. Um, between the three of them, many of the students spend a lot of time uh, in our office and getting to know uh, Dr. Vega. And she has become truly a pivotal part of that connection between our office and the student body. Next slide. In addition, uh, we work very closely with the student organization. So uh, the SMA president, which is the Student National Medical Association president, uh, works closely with our office, uh, as well as the uh, Latino Medical Student Association, LMSA. Um, and we also have a diversity rep that serves on the student government body for the school that also works very closely with our office. And, and between these three individuals and other leaders of different student organizations, we be able, we're able to share information, uh, gather information of what students might be dealing with around the diversity perspective, and it forms a very collaborative network of opportunities for our students. Next slide. So our mission, um, without reading the whole thing, uh, we're guided by our mission, which is grounded essentially in creating a learning and working environment that is essentially supportive of everyone, students, faculty members, uh, staff, uh, to reach their fullest potential, regardless of age, gender, racial orientation, race, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, or, se or socioeconomic status. We, we are the, the open door for all those that come to our office. And our job is to help to create this environment that is supportive for all students. And we're very excited to have that opportunity. Now we do this by a couple of ways. We, we provide academic and social support for our students. Uh, we work, as I mentioned, with all the, the diverse student body organizations and usually in particular around commemor commemorative month activities, whether it be Hispanic Heritage Month or Women in Health Month or Black History Month. Uh, we do all this together with our student organizations. Uh, we offer a lot of opportunities for students to get engaged with our diverse faculty, both formal and informal settings, and also provide medical students opportunities to shadow physicians and a number of specialties and helping them with their professional development, particularly around uh, attending certain national conferences. Next slide. So I wanted to give you just a quick snapshot of just a few of the things, because we do quite a few things in the office. But uh, just to share, um, students and faculty have a wealth of opportunity to get involved with our office. And the ones I wanted to highlight for you this evening is our most recent initiative started by Dean Ford, which is our Task Force on Racial Justice. This was created in response to the incredible racial justice movement that's been happening in our country and emerged from the heartbreaking death due to police brutality. And essentially also helping us to address the need for our institution to address racial justice and racial challenges that were raised by our students, our faculty and our staff. Uh, the initiative has just launched. Uh, most of the groups, the subcommittees launched uh, just last week. And we have well over 300 students, faculty, and staff that are involved in a number of what we call subcommittees. And they range from things like faculty affairs to student wellness to curriculum development 
and research, just to name a few. But we're very excited about this particular opportunity and particularly heartened to see so many students involved in this initiative. We also have our Dean's Diversity Council, which are representatives from each of the clinical departments and basic science departments, but also students are involved. Many of our student leaders are part of this. And this is the group that meets regularly to help us look at certain diversity issues and trying to figure out strategies and actions and put maybe potentially implementing new initiatives to improve the overall context for our school. In addition, we do, as I mentioned before, a number of lunch and learn series. And these usually are grounded around certain uh, cultural months or cultural heritage months, as I mentioned before. And again, the students and faculty really enjoy it. And we leverage a lot of the expertise of the faculty within the school to lead these. And then, as I mentioned, the student organizations are available for students. And lastly, uh, we have incredible summer programs that we run. Um, usually this year, we did it virtually because of COVID. But it's an opportunity either through our MCAT program or our medical scholars program that students can serve as teaching assistants and be role models and provide leadership for young emerging physicians that want to go to medical school. So this, this tends to be one of the favorite activities and we always welcome and look for opportunities for our medical students to get involved. Next slide. Just to give you a quick visual, this is what our office looks like. Um, more recently, just probably a little over a year, we revamped the office and we're very excited, but it, plays, it creates a safe space for students to come together, to share, to have discussions about what's going on, and we're very excited to be able to offer this to our students, and it's very well used, so we're, we're happy to see that it is space that is well used by our students. So, last slide. Uh, just if you want to learn more about us, this is where we are uh, we're with everyone, all of our other offices and how you can follow us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and on the internet. And with that, I will transition to my colleague, Dr. Chris Alabia, who is the Associate Professor of Clinical Ophthalmology and Assistant Dean for Student Affairs. Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Roderick. And, uh... Good evening, everyone. Uh, we just are so excited to have you here and welcome to the University of Miami family. I'm Chris Alabiad, I'm the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs and I have the honor of sharing with you some of the roles that Student Affairs takes part in. And we're an exemplary team of faculty, including Dr. Anna Campo and Julie Belkowitz and staff that support approximately 800 students who are pursuing their MD degree. And our objective is to ensure that we foster a safe and a fertile learning environment that supports students from all backgrounds and all walks of life. And so I'll share with you some of the things that we oversee. One of my mentors told me that the most important thing to do is to show up. 97% of success is showing up. And so we oversee attendance policies, but there's gonna be times where our students are gonna be faced with some adversities that they're not able to make it to class or to a session. And so we are encouraging them to reach out to us when there's a planned or unplanned absence or an emergency, or if they need to take a little bit of time off from their studies to work on their personal wellness or even research endeavors before rejoining the MD curriculum. We also oversee grading and evaluation. Uh, we monitor this progress of our students from an academic perspective on a fairly regular basis to make sure that they're meeting the criteria and thresholds to advance to the next level. But we also monitor their professional behaviors as well and discuss them amongst the faculty. We have a very fair um, process by which various um, promotions committees can actually uh, allow for appeal processes to proceed to higher committees and ultimately the dean if the students don't agree with the decisions made uh, for them on the by the faculty. We also monitor credits and graduation requirements to ensure that they meet all the graduation requirements for our degrees. We also oversee compliance. There are various modules that we want to make sure that our students watch and, and learn from prior to engaging in activities with patients or with various activities um, on campus, perhaps in the lab. And those include our HIPAA and OSHA training but also how to interact with each other properly uh, through our Title IX training. We oversee licensing requirements. Our students are required to pass the Step 1 exam and sit for the Step 2 CK and CS exam prior to graduating. 
We oversee international study and travel. We want to make sure our students are safe. So prior to having them go to their international destination to learn medicine in a different location, we want to ensure that they understand the protocols in place for their safety in case there's a natural disaster or political unrest in their place of study. So we meet with them prior to their departure to ensure that all is well and that they have a good plan in place. We also want to make sure that the academic rigor of the program that they're undertaking meets our requirements as well. We have social networking policies that we want to ensure that the students follow. They're now members of our community and as such, there are standards that they have to uphold uh, when they have the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine name attributed to them. We also oversee the Code for Honorable and Professional Conduct, which is also known as our Ethics Council. And our Ethics Council deals with situations in which students may not be dealing with each other in a proper fashion, uh, especially as it relates to perhaps cheating on exams or other unprofessional activities. We oversee visiting students and externships. Our students love to go to other institutions during their fourth year of medical school to just get a different experience in a different learning environment. But we also similarly welcome students to our programs as well to experience the breadth and diversity of the clinical training that we have to offer here at the University of Miami and Jackson Memorial Hospital. So we need to ensure that those students who do visit are aware of our policies and procedures as well. We give letters of enrollment and good standing. We also help students postpone jury duty if they need to. And we even deal with students after they graduate. So we deal with the doctors for the rest of their lives. When it comes to credentialing them, uh, with the licensing board of various states and other uh, forms that they may need us to fill out. And lastly, we oversee the Physicianship and Professionalism Advocacy Program. Professionalism is an attribute um, and competency that's demanded of all physicians that graduate from the University of Miami. And this program establishes a process to monitor, evaluate, and improve the professional behaviors of our medical students at UMMSM. And here is just a slide that shows the web page where students can actually um, report unprofessional behaviors, or they can actually report commendable behaviors between the other fellow students, faculty, staff, residents, etc. And we actually engage with training the students as to how to access this resource, um, and we use it for formative feedback. Not everyone is born knowing how to behave 100% perfectly. And so we try to help develop the professional development of our students through this formative mechanism. And we also have a cane watch program for more egregious violations that include discrimination or sexual harassment, um, along with other ways that students may be able to report these egregious acts. And I believe that summarizes in a nutshell all the things that Student Affairs does and with no further ado, I'm gonna introduce my amazing colleague, Dr. Halit Machaber, who's a graduate of the BSMD program in 1995. She went on to do an internal medicine residency at George Washington University, and then came right back home to the University of Miami School of Medicine as a member of the internal medicine department. Halit. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I am indeed a proud Kane graduating from undergrad and med school here, and it is my privilege to serve as the Associate Dean for Student Services. So in this role, like you've heard from my wonderful team, it's my opportunity to provide and oversee the services that help support your students through their very uh, incredible and lengthy journey through medical school as we help them transition into becoming the incredible transformative leaders of the future that Dean Ford talked about. Next slide. I wanted to share with our parents the message that I give to your students during orientation every year, because I think this sets the tone for how you can be most helpful. I'll also get to a few of the questions that were raised in the chat thus far about safety, because many of these services to really help support our students and protect them are part of the realm of what my office oversees. So we talk about four really important goals. We want our students to understand that all of us on our incredible medical education team are here to support them. We want them to know that there's a wealth of information and it's at their fingertips and they're certainly far more skilled at accessing things online than we are. 
but we really do our best to make sure that all of the information is available to them at all times. They do need to take the initiative to look for it at times to make sure that they are up to date and aware of all of the policies, procedures, and services that are available to them. I will spend a lot of time during our orientation and also have shared before orientation with all of your students information about the importance of their health and well being. We can't have them be successful students if they're not personally healthy and if they're not attending to their well being. And now more than ever in this current era, I don't really need to delve into why that's incredibly important, but know that their safety and their health is our priority as well. And the last is what I really like to emphasize the most with our parents, and that is reminding our students that they're human and that they can't be scared to ask for help. I share with them and I'll share with you that most of your students are the ones who are coming into a helping profession and they're used to being the helpers. It's very rare that most of our students have ever had to ask for academic support and maybe at times have had to have some other kind of health or uh, administrative support. But this is not what they're used to and is probably, in my experience, one of the hardest things for our medical students to learn. So we really go out of our way to make it clear that the services are available and without asking for help from those services, we won't be as successful in their journey. Next slide. When we talk about what we oversee in student services, the list is here and like student affairs, we provide many, many different resources and in many different aspects. So overall, when you think about health and wellness, those are obvious things like access for medical students to healthcare. Behavioral healthcare is incredibly important and we're really proud of our robust programs, overseeing their health insurance, their enrollment, their immunizations, keeping up with all of the requirements as healthcare workers. We have a very robust wellness program that has expanded over the years and we're really excited with NextGenMD for all of the ongoing programmatic changes in the curriculum that will support additional facets of wellness in the curriculum and outside of the curriculum. We spend much of our time focusing on academic counseling and support as well as career counseling and their professional development starting from the very first few weeks of medical school. You heard about our professionalism program. My office also oversees any students who need or are granted uh, academic or physical accommodations. We are the liaison to our ombudsperson on campus and many more. Next slide, please. I mentioned that two of our most recent innovations that we're very excited about are our Wellness Advisory Council. This is an incredible group of student leaders who came together now almost four years ago to create a student-led and collaborative initiative to integrate all components of wellness, both in the curriculum and out of the curriculum. And you'll hear more, our students will hear more about this from their student leaders. Next paragraph, uh, sorry, <laughs> next, uh, next slide. I feel like I'm dictating, I apologize. Another really exciting innovation is the peer support network. Our students came together and said, we have a lot of wonderful services, but students still trust their peers the most. So this is a group of now about 24 peers in all of our classes who have been trained to help serve as advocates for our students so that if they feel more comfortable reaching out to someone in their class or an upperclassman to just share concerns, our students are trained how to help support them and how to make sure that our students are guided to all the resources that exist for them on campus. Next slide. I mentioned this because your students will see this during orientation also repeatedly. And again, as I mentioned, asking for help is not something that they're used to. They often feel stressed to not be able to take time for self-care, whether that's time that they need away, or more importantly, time for appointments. We recognize that sometimes their schedules are out of their own control, and we work with them particularly in my office to make sure that if students need help or need something scheduled, that they will have the time they need for their self-care. So as parents, one of the ways that you've heard some of my colleagues mention you can be most helpful remind your students that they're not alone in asking for help, that resources are available and are of no use if they're not asking for help, and to please take the time that they need and to follow our recommendations for how to access care, especially if they need additional time for self-care. Next slide. I think that is it. 
So I wanted to take a moment and just answer a few questions that came up from the chat, particularly about protocols and uh, COVID. There were two questions that came up. Is there a protocol for students if they become ill and has that been shared? So I will share with all of you in the chat um, the website where we store all of this for our medical students, but know that your students have been receiving information already from us and posted to their pre-orientation course all about COVID. Uh, Dr. Agarwal talked about our re-entry and the re-entry protocol is posted for them as well as links to the surveys that we will ask them to complete if they should become symptomatic. And part of that protocol is for them to complete the survey so that they can be connected with our employee health team that is available across the entire medical campus to also serve our medical students. So anytime our students have any symptoms of question of, or they are worried about a potential exposure, they have all the information about who they were supposed to call and their daily symptom survey also gives them that information again about how to process their concerns, who to reach, and I get notified as well. So actually my counterpart, Dr. Amy Zito, our Dean at the Regional Campus for Student Services and me, have uh, for the past few months actually been managing any concerns that are raised on a daily basis and making sure our students are cared for. There was another question that just asked about exposures and uh, infection rate in our medical students. And what we're very proud of is that we have not had any of our clinical students in the third or fourth year have any known exposures from any clinical setting meaning no exposure to a patient that resulted in any known infection. We have had a few students in the third and fourth year actually test positive, and when investigated, those were all from community exposures. We have had five so far amongst 500, uh, 400 students, and those positive tests came from known exposures without appropriate uh, personal protective equipment in the community, and those have sparked very significant communications with the classes, again, as you've heard, for our need for them to adhere to policies and procedures in the community to keep them well. So I wanted to make sure I address those, and it is my pleasure to move on to introducing one of our wonderful student leaders, Sophia Pines. And Sophia is our one of our co-executive directors for the DOCS, Department of Community Service, Wolfson Program, and Sophia, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Machaber. Um, so like she said, my name is Sophia, fourth year medical student. I'll be here on the student panel, um, and I want everyone else on the panel to introduce themselves before we get started. So um, if Alexa, you want to go first. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexa Turpin. I'm a fourth year. I am an, the executive director with, of DOCS with Sophia, and I am also the curriculum rep for my for the MD class of 2021. Thank you, Yen. Hi there, everyone. My name is Du Yen. I am a third year medical student. I was a curriculum representative. Uh, Alexa was one of my mentors for the last two years, and this year I'm the student government executive president. And Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Murdoch. I'm a current MS3, and I'm also the class of 2022 president. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we're here to answer um, all of your questions, um, at least from the student perspective. We do have some questions that were sent in before. Um, so I'll start with one of those, and then as you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, rather than the chat, the Q&A um, is better for us to see, and we'll address them as they come. Um, so the first thing we wanted to talk about, um, since Dr. Agusquiza mentioned it at the beginning of this, um, is the Wolfson Docs program and how the um, parents play a role in it and how important it is for our students. So Alexa and I are both the executive directors for this year. Wolfson Docs is a student-run organization um, that serves the underserved in South Florida, Miami-Dade, Broward, as well as Monroe County. Um, we do this through several ways, but most notably through our 10 annual health fairs, as well as our weekly clinics where we provide primary and specialty care. Um, all of these are staffed by student volunteers, overseen by resident physicians and attending physicians. So students get a really, um, it's a really great place for students to get lots of clinical skills practice 
get out there in the community, get to know the people of Miami and the people they'll be serving for the next four years, at least. Um, so we also have some other programs um, where parents are a little bit less involved going on on the back end. We have a really robust patient navigation program. We also have an emergency preparedness team, which helped a lot during the COVID-19 um, crisis when it all you know, started. Um, I'll let Alexa talk a little bit about how DOCS is affected by COVID, because as you may imagine, our typical health fairs and clinics um, have had to be altered a bit and we're working on the back end how we can make those work safely. Yeah, so um, one of the main things that Sophia and I have been working on since we returned uh, back to campus is getting docs up and running again. So our tentative plan right now um, is to actually have all of our weekly night clinics start the week of August 24th. We're gonna start with half of our patients that we usually have um, as well as most, the, the main volunteers are going to be the project teams and upperclassmen from the docs executive board, just so that we can sort of feel out the water and see how everything goes, make sure it runs smoothly. And then once we have an idea of how clinics are really going to work and everything is running smoothly, we're going to invite um, all of the students to volunteer. One of the things we pride ourselves in docs um, about is that students can volunteer from their first day of medical school. So we're really looking forward to welcoming all of your, all of the incoming uh, first years into docs. We're also planning on running our health fairs. They're obviously going to look a lot different this year. Um, some, of, some of our most attended health fairs have upwards of 400 patients. That's obviously not going to be feasible this year with COVID, but we are still planning on doing the health fairs. Although, like I said, we haven't completely worked out the details all of the community partners that we work with are very open and willing to um, allow us to host health fairs and feel like this is still a big need in our community. So like I said, we're really looking forward to welcoming all of the incoming students into our organization and we're excited to have new volunteers. I'll just add on, um, we are also very open and docs to volunteering outside of our usual scope. So while students were home for the, um, you know, from March to June, we were volunteering with several projects that were going on on campus. We were volunteering with the Florida Department of Health COVID-19 hotline, having students answer the phones, several other research projects. So um, as far as, you know, maybe we aren't able to have as robust health fairs and clinics, we are still having our students participate in community service and we're getting these opportunities to them. Also, and usually our parents, our wonderful parents usually help out at our health fairs. Um, either by providing supplies or by actually volunteering on the day of. Um, we are really working hard to figure out how, you know, parents will play a role this year with um, COVID-19, you know, messing with our plans a bit. But we will keep you all in the loop and um, let you know how you guys can help. All right, so um, there's lots of questions coming into the Q&A. So I will start um, with one of the one at the top. So if anyone wants to answer, so what types of social and networking events are there to facilitate interactions and introductions among the first year students, given the virtual nature of the curriculum? I can answer part of it and ask our students to answer. My video is not working, so I can just talk. Um, maybe Bridget can put me back on. Not necessary. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Bridget. So as early as the first day of actually pre-orientation, we have a really exciting event tomorrow evening called our Society Reveal, where all of your students will learn what academic society they have been assigned to, which is really one of their, their homes, away from home, if you will. I'll ask our students to chime in a little bit more about that. So that will be virtual. And that will continue with a lot of interactive pieces that we've added into our orientation. We recognize that our students can't meet in the hallways and necessarily get to know each other while they're waiting in line. So we're doing everything we can along with our student leaders to create interactive environments using virtual technology. Thank you, Dr. Machaber. Um, Dewey and Alexa, or Chris, does anyone want to add something? All right, okay, so we'll move on um, to the next question. Um, so this one's mainly, well, actually we're all now clerkship students. So did COVID change your rotation schedules? Um, so I'll take that yeah. question um, yeah. because I'm actually going into pediatric surgery, which is not offered everywhere. Um, so I was a little bit nervous because there were some rumors about us not being able to 
work at Jackson and do our sub eyes at Jackson. And Jackson actually reversed that decision and allowed us to do our sub internships there. So I've been working, doing my pediatric uh, sub intern, pediatric surgery sub internship there for the last three weeks. And I'm having the same experience as I would otherwise have had uh, prior to COVID, just wearing a lot more PPE, obviously, and doing a little, of uh, doing fewer procedures because we're not doing elective procedures. Um, so I don't feel that it's really impacted my ability to get letters of recommendation or anything like that. So I, I still feel like I'm getting a really great learning experience and it's actually been really uh, beneficial for me to learn in this era of a pandemic, an opportunity that I may not otherwise ever have to get in my career. Um, Sophia, did you want to review some of the pre-submitted questions um, prior to the session? Yeah, so I was actually going to jump in if you wanted to add um, on how the school handled like uh, COVID-19 when it first happened and how that affected our schedules and then um, kind of what's going on now. Go ahead. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'd like to start from the beginning. So uh, pre-clerkship students, meaning first and second year students, were removed from the hospital starting at March 11th, and then third and fourth year students were pulled from the clinic starting March, uh, March 13th. So we had a very uh, rapid response in ensuring that students were not unnecessarily exposed during a time where COVID was, um, was spiking in Miami. Um, the deans then reached out to student leaders and so we could communicate and collaborate on how best to navigate such unprecedented times. And we prioritized the graduation requirements of the MS4s as well as the completion of the basic science requirements for the MS1s and 2s. Considering the fact that it was such a high stress time, not just because of the COVID pandemic, but also because students were now in um, unfamiliar settings that aren't necessarily conducive to studying. Uh, for example, being in a household that's full of children or pets. Um, and so considering that um, student leaders advocated for on students' behalf about how um, best to accommodate for these very high stress times. And so the course directors listened and um, they actually changed majority of exams to being pass fail or open notes in order to, uh, uh, in recognition that students were going through times that they were um, not expecting or uh, were not prepared for. Um, in addition, the deans actually modified their step one and two requirements. And so originally and traditionally, we all, um, MS, Twos would take step one during dedicated, which is the end of their year, uh, and during the summer before they start um, MS3. This year, however, we were provided with multiple options, and so students would be able to choose whichever option worked best for them, and weighing the options uh, and the pros and cons, um, they were able to make the best choice for them. Um, Additionally, the Wellness Advisory Council that you had heard Dr. Machaber speak about with student services, um, they actually started programming and holding online sessions to keep students engaged and connected, holding yoga sessions, cooking sessions, even making a cheese board, as well as actually organizing a Miller 100 mile run where um, students could log their miles and um, really uh, engage in the community as well as their um, their, um, their colleagues as well. Um, furthermore, I think what was what makes us most proud is how students mobilized during this time, and they um, uh, helped try to help uh, those who are most affected by the pandemic. I actually have a Google form for, or a Google document for those who are interested in seeing what efforts that students have been engaged in so far, and this includes um, uh, finding masks and um, collecting masks for healthcare workers, or even uh, dispensing masks to um, the homeless population in Miami. Uh, this also includes research efforts to try to understand the impact COVID has had on medical students, healthcare workers, and our community. Um, furthermore, we had uh, infectious disease experts and public health experts that work um, uh, at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine create a COVID elective for those students who are interested in remaining up to date on the novel ongoing research of the cause of this pandemic um, while also remaining a safe distance and not having uh, or being unnecessarily exposed to uh, the virus. Um, obviously, returning to the clerkships was inevitable. And so uh, we recognize that virtual edification of clinical skills is not 
uh, cannot never replace real experiences. And so MS4s returned in early June while MS3s returned in July. Um, this occurred gradually to ensure that um, the clinical rotation sites were available for both classes of 2021 and 2022 without sacrificing our guidelines on social distancing. Um, as Dr. Agarwal has already mentioned and reviewed some of the protocols that students were mandated to follow upon return to campus, they also supplied us with uh, weekly PPE um, to ensure that we were properly um, um, uh, safe. And in addition to that, um, students are required to complete a daily symptom check before coming to campus. And if symptomatic, um, we are provided with the protocol and the next steps of what to do in that same survey, as well as what was outlined in Dr. Um, Chabra's website that she shared with you guys in the chat. Um, for those students who uh, were still, uh, had reservations um, about returning to campus, there was um, a possibility of students asking for a leave of absence, either temporary, which would not end up um, uh, delaying their graduation, or a, a year-long leave of absence, depending on what students felt was best for them. And so essentially what I, uh, 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 what I want to conclude is that Miller had a rapid response to uh, the COVID pandemic. And in addition, what's more important is that they were supportive of students and ensured that they accommodated with whatever was necessary while also not sacrificing the requirements and the experiences of, um, of the clinic at the same time. Thank you, Duyan, um, for that nice summary. So because of um, lack of time, we'll just answer one more question and then we'll um, turn it back over to Dr. Agustiza. So um, the last question in the chat or in the Q&A is, how many hours a week of work uh, is expected from a first year medical student? Um, how are they broken down in terms of class time, assignment times, um, all of that. So looks like Dr. Deshpan. Sure, I can, I can answer that. Um, so in phase one, which is what we uh, described as the first 14 months, uh, it's broken into mornings and afternoons. And so the students are, um, are with us live, or in this case on Zoom, uh, four mornings a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, from about eight or somewhere between eight and nine to about noon. And then their afternoon schedule uh, varies by four different cohorts. Again, when, Wednesday is basically um, free of curricular, of, of design curricular activities uh, because of how the units of, this, of, the, uh, of the week work. So they're in, they're with us either on Zoom or live, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday mornings. And the afternoons, depending on what their dual degree or scholarly concentration is, They'll have an afternoon a week of that. That could be their Master's of Public Health. It could be their scholarly concentration in immunology or social medicine, whatever their extra niche is. Um, they'll have an afternoon a week of their medicine as a profession, uh, which is the thing I talked about, the seven different themes. And uh, as designed, a, um, an afternoon a week of an early clinical experience. That is obviously in the fall going to be tempered by what we're able to pull off during the pandemic in terms of being able to go see patients um, in a live setting. So we'll find some alternative methods to do so. Uh, but that's basically how it is, four mornings a week and on average about three afternoons a week uh, dedicated, uh, dedicated to that. So that's, that's the actual kind of in, uh, in curriculum hours. And then the rest of the time, including Wednesdays and the weekends are opportunities for self-directed learning and, um, and learning in, in small groups. Great, thank you, Dr. Nishpande. Um, so again, in the interest of time, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Aguskiza for closing remarks. We are so incredibly proud of our Miller School of Medicine students. Over the next few months, the Medical Parents Association will assess the opportunities to assist our students. We would love for you to join us. A link to the online Medical Parents Association membership form is located in the Zoom chat box. Thank you to those who have already joined after signing up online through yesterday's confirmation email. In the next few days, you will receive a membership email. In the past, membership has supported many initiatives such as Wolfson's Docs Health Fairs and Student Awards. This year, the funds will be used to adapt to the students' needs and improve their experience. Dues are only $200 for all four years of medical school. As an added perk, all MPA members receive reserved floor seating at commencement, which will be here before you know it. On behalf of Dr. Lourdes Angenis and myself, 
Welcome to the Miller School. Thank you for joining us. Good night and stay safe. Now, I would ask all the panelists to turn on the cameras to join us in throwing up the youth. <laughs>